Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being part of this important conversation. This is Congressman Adriano Espaya representing the 13th Congressional District, including Harlem, East Harlem, Hamilton Heights, Washington Heights, Inwood Marble Hill, and the Northwest Bronx. And so this is an important conversation that we bring to you uh, with uh, what I think will be great help for small businesses. Uh, this pandemic has been a very difficult one, and perhaps one of the sectors of our community hard hit has been small businesses, particularly restaurants. Because of that, the federal government and through the help of the House of Representatives, we have allocated funding to the Small Business Administration to bring help and assistance to small businesses, particularly those businesses with 10 or less employees. Uh, we also allocated in one of our rounds of help uh, funding for restaurants. Restaurants have been severely hurt. They, they were shut down. They were re, uh, downsized in terms of the their capacity and have been struggling to stay open for some time. And of course, uh, they are an important part of our economy. And in many ways, they help define the personality of our neighborhoods. Uh, so this is really uh, who we are. And so we have a great team of participants, panelists in this conversation. And first, let's start with, we have with us Assemblywoman Carmen De La Rosa from Northern Manhattan, Beth Goldberg, who is the director of the Small Business Administration in New York. And we have a small businesswoman, a restaurant owner uh, in Harlem, Susanna Cotin. And she is the owner of El Lido, Lido a restaurant right in Harlem. So welcome all of you for, uh, uh, first for being part of this conversation and for the work that you do for small businesses. So let's start with the Assemblywoman. I know that you have been very active in bringing assistance to small businesses. And I know that uh, we have been at this, this conversation before to outline the help that we get through the Small Business Administration and the Paycheck Protection Program, as well as other programs within the Small Business Administration. And we were blessed in Northern Manhattan also to get a $10 million grant from New York Presbyterian. But uh, we want to ask you, Assemblywoman, uh, what is being uh, given at the state level to small businesses and restaurants and other businesses that you can share with the public? And thank you for being part of this conversation. My pleasure, Congressman, and thank you for putting together this wonderful panel. And all of the familiar faces on here have really been um, people who have been taking to the streets to make sure that our small businesses are engaged in the conversations for COVID recovery. Um, we know that our small businesses are the lifeblood of our city, of our economic engines for our local economy and our city economy. So they are so important and we wanna make sure that folks know that we are working um, to make sure that our small businesses continue to thrive um, and that they're able to recover with equity and intention uh, past COVID-19. So we are very grateful by the way, Congressman, for the uh, help that we received from the federal government. Without that help, the state budget would have, would have been in trouble. And so we wanna thank you for your leadership on that as well. And in the state budget, I'm, I'm happy to report that we were able to uh, secure $800 million for small businesses across the state. Sm small businesses that have 100 or fewer employees are eligible to receive uh, grants from the state of New York. Those grants can be used towards your rent, your taxes, utility bills. And basically, if you can demonstrate that you have had a 40% loss of income due to COVID-19, you will be able to apply for this funding from New York State. The program is being designed and will be um, available soon, more information so that our community can recover. And as I said, for us in Northern Manhattan, we've experienced a lot like Harlem, a renaissance in Upper Manhattan with many restaurants and, and small businesses that are really um, how our community is able to stay employed not just minimum wage jobs, but gainful employment that makes a difference for the quality of life of our community. And so we wanna make sure that as we have the discussion about jobs and small businesses that we are um, really highlighting 
the the treasure that our small businesses have been here in northern Manhattan, in Washington Heights, and in Inwood and Marble Hill. Um, the hospitality industry is the second largest employer after healthcare, and so we have to continue to highlight that. And I think our state budget did a, a good job of ensuring that, uh, along with the federal help that is available, that our small businesses will have a leg up. Um, especially uh, minority and women-owned businesses, uh, we made sure there were provisions in that in those grants to make sure that those organizations and uh, businesses are also able to thrive. And so we're excited about what the future holds, and we'll be working hand in hand with the congressman and and, and the panel and our small businesses to make sure we get this information out to the community. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Thank you for your fine work in in Albany. I know that it was a priority for us to get a state and local government help. Uh, so that you wouldn't be forced to make those budget cuts that would have impacted programs like the ones you adopted to help small businesses. But let's go to someone that's on the ground and really uh, feeling it uh, at a very local level and has been there in the trenches uh, trying to keep her business open and provide uh, the services that she has so provided for so, uh, such a long time in Harlem. Uh, and someone that continues to uh, be a leader with the small business community and the restaurant community. Let's hear from Susanna Coteen. And Susanna, we want to find out what has, how has it been for you? I mean, share the challenges, the good, the good things that have happened, the not so good things that have happened, and how we can continue to move forward together. Okay, well, thank you so much for inviting me and thank you all for the work that you've done and for putting small businesses as a priority because I'm very passionate about it as well. Um, you know, I love, I live in Harlem. Um, Lido uh, has been on the corner of 117th and Frederick Douglass Boulevard for a little over 10 years. Um, we just, you know, during the right, Pre-pandemic, we had planned to open a new, a new restaurant three doors down, and it opened during the pandemic, uh, which is called Bixie, and that's between 116 and 117. I know it's been a really challenging year for everyone, and, uh, you know, it's it's been a really challenging year for myself as well. Delivery and to-go food wasn't enough to sustain us, so we had to close twice, and um, both, we, we were lucky enough to be able to get both rounds with PPP, and that's been a huge help, a challenge and a huge help. I mean, you know, when it first rolled out, I know um, people realized that, you know, you had to use 75% of the PPP for, for wages. You know, we were closed at the time, um, but I kept saying to everyone, like, I'm going to take it one step at a time, and and that's what we've done, and uh, we're very grateful to still be here and still have most of our employees, if they haven't moved out of the state, most of our employees are back. And the reason why I'm also the co-president of the Frederick Douglass Boulevard Alliance, and I also sit on the board of the New York City Hospitality Alliance, is because I love New York, I love the restaurant business, and I think it's really important for people to realize you know, what a strong employer we are. We don't only keep people employed. And I'll give one small example. There's a young man that works has worked for me since the day we opened. When I first met him, he was working across the street at Rite Aid. And he was moving and smart and smiling at people and looking him in the eye and multitasking. And I said, would you like a job across the street? He'd still be making minimum wage. Now he's, he, you know, he started as a busser, you know, food runner, bartenders and server and you know he's making multiple times minimum wage he supports his family with this job and I you know I take that as my responsibility and something that gives me a lot of um, joy to be you know able to provide those jobs so it's jobs it's tax revenue uh, we clean our whole block there's so many regulars that come all the time you know they gather here they meet one another it's community so I just um, clearly restaurants are something I'm really you know passionate about and again, very grateful for the help that we've been given so far and really looking forward to learning about the, the restaurant grant process and through Frederick Douglass Boulevard Alliance, um, we will help our, you know, part of our mission is to co-market all the independently owned businesses along, along the Frederick Douglass Boulevard in Harlem. And we will try to help um, others navigate uh, through, this, through this grant process, which is really a lifeline to help us keep the lights on and people employed and the tax revenue coming in when the city really, you know, clearly needs it. 
Uh, and and you, I think you you explained it very well. Uh, many of the businesses uh, are so caught up on the everyday challenge on having to open up or keeping their standards uh, in compliance with the city and state, uh, making sure that they meet the guidelines, that it makes it very difficult for them to access uh, grants and and paycheck protection to, and the likes. And so we almost have to hold their hands in the process. And, and you've done a great job at that. So, but now let's, let's listen to someone that I think, um, you know, in reality uh, has uh, done that for the region, right? And, and as well as for my district. And she's been on several of these shows and has done a tremendous job explaining to uh, uh, local folks, local businesses, how to access what's available through the Small Business uh, Administration. And she is the director of the New York Small Business Administration office. And Beth Goldberg, who I think has done a tremendous job at explaining PPP and the funding that's available for restaurants. And so if you like, uh, can we hear from you, uh, share the information that's in the PPP program, and also very specifically how much money is available for restaurants and how they can access it. Sure, thank you, Congressman, for inviting me to be with you again today. And uh, Assemblywoman, uh, thank you for the efforts of uh, leading the state to help join us in serving the business community. Um, so PPP, which most people are most familiar with at this time for good or bad, whichever way it's going, um, we have, uh, as of last week, we still have $35 billion left in PPP for round two, round one for people who didn't participate in round two. Um, most local banks, micro lenders, uh, community banks and FinTechs are offering the program. And uh, um, uh, Susanna had mentioned 75% for payroll. In the last round of PPP that was signed uh, by Congress, thank you, they lowered that to 60% for uh, payroll, 40% for other expenses and expenses that um, help businesses uh, with COVID, uh, such as PPE, building outdoor spaces for restaurants, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so that is still available and uh, will be so until May 31st of this year or until money runs out. I also just briefly want to mention that our disaster loan program has also been extended uh, until December 31st of this year, 2021. And uh, I believe about 10 go days ago, our administrator upped the amount of money from 150,000 or six months of working capital, whichever is less to $500,000 covering a 24 month period. And any other loans or grants that you got, uh, you would back out that money. So if you applied for payroll for February, March and April in your PPP loan, you wouldn't be using uh, the, the IDL loan for February, March, and April. And then the restaurant program, I just got a press release from my administrator, the Isabella Guzman, right before we started. So on uh, April 30th, you will be able to start drafting your application. And there is a guide online at sba.gov. Um, there are several web webinars going on today and tomorrow, which has an attendance of 20,000 people per a limit of 20,000 people to teach you. And there is a guide online uh, for the restaurant revitalization program. Due to our leadership in Congress, uh, including uh, Congressman Espiat, who sits on the Small Business Committee, the first round of funding for the first 21 days will be limited to businesses who self-certify that they are small businesses owned by either women or veterans or are socially and economically disadvantaged people. Nine and a half billion dollars are reserved for these categories of business owners and the set aside 
I'm sorry, I have to look at my notes because this all just came out and it's still fresh congressman to me. Uh, Five billion will be set aside for applicants with gross receipts in 2019 of not more than $500,000. Four billion will be set aside for applicants in this category with um, gross receipts in 2019 from $500,001 to one million and a half and 500 million for applicants with 2019 gross sales of not more than $50,000. The rest, it'll be open to all restaurants with 20 or less at, uh, 20 or less locations. Maximum grant is $5 million. And for people with multiple locations, no more than $10 million. Can you explain, Beth, the, the, uh, the extra advantages for restaurants in the uh, PPP program? Oh, oh, the NACE code 20, 72. I'm sorry, Congressman. Yeah. Yes, for those businesses with NACE code 72, instead of two and a half months of payroll. So you take your, uh, instead of two and a half uh, month times your formula, you're allowed three and a half times uh, the formula that's appropriate for your business. So if you were a small independent business that files a schedule C, for example, you can now use line seven gross profits versus line 38, which was net profit and uh, you would divide that number by 12. And if your NACE code starts with 72, you would multiply that number by 3.5 instead of 2.5. Okay, one other piece of information that I think is uh, the IDLE program, which is not a loan program, but a grant program. Uh, uh, Beth, can you share some of that information, please? The IDLE program, Congressman, is the loan program, the revitalization, the re restaurant revitalization fund is a payment. It's not a grant nor a loan, and it's not repayable as long as you file your paperwork and you use your money through March 11th, 2023. There's no repayment on that. So it's for calling it a payment based on what you put into the system. Point of sale operators such as Toast, uh, Clover Square, and NCR are working with the SBA to use your numbers that are reported from there and fill out your application directly through those point of sales. And the amount of money that you receive based on your formula and your information, you receive a, a payment. And as long as you use the money and report it once a year until it's used up, that money is uh, uh, does not have to come back to the SBA. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's important that we get um, that type of information. Uh, we'll go back to a real quick uh, last um, round of questions and statements. So Assemblywoman, uh, I know that uh, the beauty salons, the the Nair salons, the bodegas, restaurants, the livery cab bases in the district uh, have faced great challenges. And these are high risk uh, jobs that are out there. People that are workers that are essential workers in many cases that are out there uh, in contact with, with hundreds if not thousands of people. And so uh, I wanna know from you assembly, what are the challenges that you see in the diverse businesses in your community? Thank you, Congressman. Yes, you pointed to one of the major ones, which is the outdoor structures, um, which are very expensive, as well as um, being able to purchase PPE and the necessary supplies to keep their employees safe. Um, but I think overall, what I continue to hear is the um, the lack of clarity around certain regulations. Um, we've been working with some of the small businesses because for example, the State Liquor Authority has been an agency that has kind of been coming down on some of our small businesses and giving some violations and tickets for things that are fairly new, right? Without much explanation or due process to be able to fight back. So in a moment where our restaurants, for example, are trying to come back, enjoy some of the nice weather to get people in the door, they're finding themselves fighting fines, really, and fighting for their lives in order to keep- And, and I've been uh, aware of these. And some of them are as simple as uh, well, some of those outdoor structures have like a plax, plastic covering with a zipper on the side, and maybe the zipper wasn't fully up 
as oh, opposed okay. to being maybe 50% uh, open and not 100% open. And they get a very steep, you know, seven, $8,000 fine for something like this. Uh, right. Outrageous and could really uh, put a, a business out of work. Uh, so can you share a little bit more about that, Assemblywoman? Yeah, absolutely. And it puts it at risk, the liquor license, which for many of our small businesses is really how they're able to make up the difference for the expensive and how expensive it is to run their businesses. So this is an issue that we're be we've been looking at. We think that the State Liquor Authority need needs more oversight um, from the legislature. Although it is an executive agency, we have the ability to regulate and legislate in order to bring some relief um, there should be clear uh, fine structures. There should be transparency around how these fines are assessed um, and how they're given due process to fight them. And there should be really a warning system because in the middle of a pandemic, when these businesses have had to rely fully on things like PPP, they shouldn't be using, you know, the little bit of money that they get in through the door to fight fines from the state. And so we've been looking at legislative solutions for that. Um, in addition to those, we also have hair salons, for example, that share spaces with barber shops. It can get very crowded in there. Um, trying to keep regulation and crowd control in those settings um, is difficult. And so they've been asking for support around that. Um, and, and we're hearing the same from uh, folks who have uh, storefronts in our community. You know, there's been a longstanding um, issues in our community around um, street vending and some of the, the conflicts that arise there. Um, understanding that everyone has, um, you know, the right to make a living, but how do we live and thrive in an environment where we all want to share now open space, open streets um, in order for our businesses to thrive. So those have been some of the challenges. I think overall, um, our small businesses continue to be per, um, to persevere. Uh, it is really what cat cat characterizes our small business community. They are creative. Um, another industry that I want to mention that has had a lot of issues is um, the gig workers, the people who rely on live entertainment, live music to try and keep our city alive. Um, they have also been a byproduct uh, harmed. Uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic because many of those jobs are not available in our community. So in order to revive our city, to keep our city going, we have to have holistic approaches to dealing with employment and support for our small businesses because they go hand in hand. So Beth, I want uh, to hear when you close up uh, about the gig workers and what they're eligible. Before we hear from Beth, how much does one of those outdoor seating structures cost? So I don't know what it was for everybody else, but for us, it was about $35,000. I mean, you have That's to think about, it's a lot of money. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm blessed because my husband is a contractor. So we built sort of a, a, you know, a real structure, but it's material, it's labor, it's more tables and chairs, it's plexiglass dividers. Um, we took electricity out of the bill. You know, we had to have an electrician come because in the winter we were trying to have it heated. The rules changed and we weren't, you know, they were considered inside. So that's when we had to close again. You know, the city has always been our biggest challenge. We could do a whole nother, a whole nother sh uh, show and the, the changing regulations, depending on who walks in and, and, you know, the fines, depending on who walks in. And again, very, very grateful for the PPP, very grateful for the upcoming grant. The city has been challenging in the best of times, but the, the, the pandemic's been tough. I'm back. Uh, gig workers. Let's let's hear from you and what they what's available in the small business administration for them, and then the shutter program. I know that you have that as well for bigger venues. Right. So the gig workers, who a lot of them are 1099 contractors, are allowed to apply on their own for PPP. They don't need the person that they're working for, and the same rules apply. Um, uh, they now, uh, most 1099 contractors don't have employees, so they use their uh, Schedule C, Line 7, gross receipts, divide that by 12, and multiply by two and a half, unless they happen to have a gig worker in the uh, restaurant yeah. industry, and they have an ACE code of 72, and then they, they're eligible for the PPP. 
uh, money. The shuttered venue grants operate opened yesterday at uh, noon, and those are for uh, venues with permanent seating, basically, and people related to the industry. Um, it is a, a um, first come, first serve. It's the first time SBA has ever been involved in a grant. Um, there are lots of workshops going on around the city, and I uh, want to say, Congressman, that Congress also provides for resource partners who help businesses for free figure out these programs and apply one. Thank you. One. Thank you, Beth. We're out of time. Okay. Thank you so much. But I do want to thank Manhattan Neighborhood Network for their opportunity for this great panel. And thank you to all the small businesses. God bless you and keep the faith.